This is Rio Lu. He went from redefining productivity as Notion's founding designer to cloning himself in a personal operating system at Cursor. My conversation with him reignited my creative soul, and it just might reignite yours. What is Rio OS? I want to show people like, oh, a designer can make all of this. Rio and I started the same way. Little kids, nerdy hobbies, creating for fun. I made my first website when I was 11. It was about this anime I liked, Detective Conan. There's like murder scenes and then there's this kid that will like investigate and do stuff. And I made it in front page. I think I put it out like in a free hosting site. They will put like little banner ads like below your website. We were the Microsoft front page generation, Dreamweaver, learning PHP from Rasmus Lerdoff's blog posts. No rules or process, just pure excitement to create. You're kind of start starting from just building things for yourself, things that you like, and then building things that others like you might like. Like I didn't know anything. I just tried different tools and figured it out. Then we grew up got jobs, got titles, designer. I think I got that most from Notion or like earlier days. I was like one of the earliest people for design. Ivan would sit like next to me and every day at like 4.30, he will come over and look at my screen and then kind of just pick at everything. I had a lot of anxiety back then. But here's what nobody told me about being a working designer. I see myself as a sponge. It's almost like you need to suck in everything from all the channels and you don't discriminate. Like designers in a lot of companies, they need to serve all the people in that chart, like below them, right? Like the marketing people, the growth people, the, the PMs, the, the engineers, the founders. You become the sponge, you suck all these information and then you give them all this constraint. Here's what we do. And I got really good at being a sponge, listening to the room, synthesizing ideas, making everyone else's vision a reality. But somewhere along the way, I forgot how to make my vision real. So why would someone build themselves into an operating system? The answer is in what designing actually became for real. I think for designers, I would actually recommend like, you know, play with the vibe coding tools to start. I don't want them to be too scared. Like Cursor right now, I think it's still like designed for like more experienced programmers. The thing that matters more now is actually like th the thinking, knowing what to build and how do I kind of describe it in a way that I can just get something out of it from the agent. He's not just building tools. He's building this way for him to think out loud. It doesn't have all the details. It doesn't have all the animations. It doesn't have all the polish. It's like rushed, it's like bad. And then the designer gets burned out because they can't make the thing they wanted to make. But now they can. People tell you to rest more, don't work so much. But what if burnout isn't only about working less? What if it's about not being able to create enough of what you want? Ryu said something I've been thinking about for years, but I've never heard somebody else say it. If you play like Age of Empires, you start the game with like, ah, you only see like your, your little town, like right here. And then you need to kind of explore the map. Like everything else is like dark, it's occluded. You need to have seen it, then you know where to go. So you need to kind of absorb inf information, like become the sponge, you kind of see it. And then you can decide, ah, maybe I want to climb this hill versus that one. I've been using the fog of war metaphor for years, but hearing Ryu say it was kind of refreshing. We're all navigating this fog of war with our careers or our ideas. And for years, I'd spent time pathfinding around the wrong part of the map. Or you can do it the other way, which is maybe you're, you're just kind of given this little box and then you're just here. And then you paint that little box, you, you paint it fully. But then the problem is the box was wrong. That is the hell to climb, not this one. Then you're fucked. Something shifted. And for me, it was Dungeons and Dragons. I became a dungeon master, weaving stories and game mechanics. And suddenly I wasn't serving anyone's vision. I was creating worlds, making rules. And it felt a lot like creating with Microsoft front page again. For Ryu, this came in the form of building his own personal operating system. What is Ryu OS? I actually, like, I don't really want to define what it is. It's like a playground. I want to show people like, oh, a designer can make all of this by, by one person. I want to show people you, you can vibe code something really fast, really deep, works well together, it feels cool. And then I want to just show people like all these abstractions, they are the same thing. 
underneath. Like I made a whole OS with apps, with windows, with files, with everything stuck in the browser, in the web page. While I was building dungeons, Ryu was building something else entirely. Ryu saw something in Notion that changed everything for him. Yeah, what pulled me to Notion was, I just thought all the SaaS stuff don't make sense. Like single purpose apps. If you look at them, they are all the same things. There is actually no difference fundamentally underneath. They're all just like data stores, databases. There are some like, you know, rows of data. They have different properties. Maybe this status is like ongoing. This is like at risk, da da da. It's all the same thing. So why are we wasting time rebuilding the same things? Like, it just didn't make sense to me. He spent years trying to abstract away complexity at Notion, but then he realized something. What took me to Cursor was, it's actually the same spirit for Notion and Cursor for myself. Cursor is just like a little bit more low level, meaning like you actually touch the code and the models beneath it. And that basically gives you like maximum possibilities. Like if you think about it, the world right now is kind of run by software. If you build a tool that can write any kind of code for anyone, then anyone can make anything. So the difference between say Notion and Cursor is, in Notion, the world, we kind of designed it ourselves for our users. And then that comes with some constraint. If you want this thing to be simple enough, you just can't have too many things. You can make each of them like combine really well and make them like super flexible, generalizable, but you will always hit a limit. But you can't make like a GTA 6. You can do some crazy stuff. You can do the SAS, but maybe not everything else. But with Cursor, you can actually make anything. You went from building constraints to breaking them, from designing boxes to eliminating them entirely. Then he said something that made me understand why teams hire him, not just to design interfaces, but to create new mental models completely. You can see like computing ideas and UX patterns over the span of like 40 years. And then if you open the iPod, there's the same thing for music for that 40 years. Just show people like all these abstractions, they are the same thing underneath. Like you're just doing the same thing in different layers of the abstractions. That's what we do for software, but it is actually the same thing. It's almost like he's building a time capsule, this sort of museum of computing ideas through which to distribute his brain functions. A lot of people don't realize like how cheap or like how, how low the cost it is to build new things now. Maybe the designer can just come up with a bunch of options and then you send it to the cursor agent. Maybe like, you know, you spend five of them. They'll build all your ideas at the same time, come back with them. You click on the link and then you see the preview and then you can make them a little better. It, it was really hard to get into building because like once I became a designer, I kind of stopped like coding or making stuff. And every time I want to go back, like I kind of look at, ah, what are the newest like web dev stuff? And then, oh fuck, I need to like reset up all the things and do my environment. Like, oh shit, what is this V thing? Like, what do I use this versus like Next.js? And I'm like, no, I don't want to do this. But this time it's just so easy. Once you get into it, it's almost like you're just, you're in this constant flow state and every time you do something and it, it, it appears and then you make it better, it gets closer to what you want and you feel really good. It's like, like very addictive, I would say. He's describing exactly what I feel when I'm running a D&D campaign or building lore light. It's not work, it's play, but it's the most serious play of my life. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I think that's what it is. Like you get that feeling back because making things there's like a lot less burden you don't have to ask for permission you don't have to like ah, i need to write a doc first and then like share it with the team and then do something like you have an idea just do it see what happens maybe it won't work it's fine try it with another model boom it works oh it's like close but not quite so let's fix this part boom it works so that's the difference. So I made a decision. Stop calling myself a designer. Stop asking permission to build and just do it. I want like, you know, like designers instead of them, uh, my PM didn't let me do this. They just fucking do it. And it's like in, in prod the next day. Or like we start not calling ourselves these random titles and we're just builders and makers. Rio showed me something crucial that this 
toy, this D&D app I'm building for myself, isn't separate from my business. It's actually a core ingredient. Let me show you exactly how this works with my D&D app Lorelei. All the D&D apps suck. I just wanted to change the lights and the music with one click while I ran my campaigns. So I spent 30 minutes with Claude and that was it, just to create a technical doc and the stack I was going to use, which was React, Tailwind, Shad CN, nothing fancy. Then I threw together some quick prototypes in Lovable and Claude code, just one shots. And they kind of sucked, but they're meant to. They're there to improve upon my existing ideas. Now I've got a working app that controls the smart lights and changes my combat music, built in days. And this is kind of my evolving process right now. If I need something, I ask AI to be a brainstorming partner, and then I generate some throwaway ideas, and then I manually improve upon those ideas until I'm ready to ship them. You don't need permission and you don't need a team. You just need a problem that you care about solving. The designers need to do things up front. The, the PMs need to do things up front. Things need to be set, decided. And then we don't waste as much cycles building stuff that we just built once. So it's almost like what took month is now maybe less than a day. Real's right. What used to take a month now takes a day. And what used to take a large team can get done by a small crew with really good tools. Tell me a little bit about what your tool stack looks like today across all the different categories of work that you perform, not just necessarily design. The browser, cursor, Notion. That's it. Almost. And so no more drag and drop canvases for you. No more. Think about that. This incredible designer who could choose any tool he wanted stuck with three things, a browser, notion, and cursor. Instead of getting stuck in these artifacts, just do the thing and make the loop. I don't think building for yourself is selfish. I think it's one of the most honest paths to market because if you need it bad enough, it's likely somebody else does too. I hope there will be like more creators, more makers, more tool makers who are the best at their game in every domain, making the best tools for people. And I think that will happen. There will be like 16 year olds making crazy shit that like we won't comprehend. And I want that to happen. For the new, 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 like people who never experienced like coding, this is actually the fastest way for them to learn code. The tools have changed. We are seeing the hard reset of mastery. And it's not just Ryu. We're seeing a whole generation already building their playgrounds. For example, my 15 year old spent his summer coding with windsurf into his Unity projects. Or Sam Pates, who shares his playground publicly on X. He's got an app for measuring how many weeks are left in a year. Or collecting pet rocks. Or growing a memory garden. These things don't serve any real utility, they're almost a new category of software as a gift. Sam is a design tool power user, but he told me he doesn't consider himself a designer. He just likes to make cool stuff. Or Lee Black, who is one of my favorite designers working today. He combines his love for music with these analog interfaces he brings to life in the browser, like this component library, which was a tribute to Dieter Rams. This thing went absolutely viral. You probably saw it, but he does a lot of things like this fully functional MIDI board he built inside of Framer or even a number of his other passion projects that he just shares online. This actually got him hired at Framer. But if you want your mind blown at the level of Ryu's operating system, allow me to introduce you to Cat aka the poet engineer. Her playground spans mediums and modalities from face tracking to motion rigging to audio responsiveness, tools like touch designer. The kind of play she's enjoying that she's sharing everywhere is truly exceptional. And it inspires me to just full send into every bit of new technology I see. But this concept of a playground doesn't have to be complicated and it doesn't have to be code. Like Tatiana Siguleva, who's been playing at the cutting edge of image and video generative tools for a while now. If you wanted to see a really good example of someone using generative AI media and turning it into something uniquely their own, or just marvel at someone who's a super user of this technology, Tatiana built a catalog of incredible work that has inspired teams like Perplexity to test the limits of these tools. Your playground is already in your head. These people just let theirs out. And as Ryu explains, there's not really a science to it. So like, I want to try some crazy ideas for Cursor, but I don't want to pollute the code base with some random shit. Then 
I'll make my own version of cursor. Like instead of doing that in Figma, I'll just come up with some ideas. You don't need full fidelity anymore. You just need to kind of maybe take a picture, put your ideas in some bullets, send, see what happens, tweak. Ryu is thinking through building. His operating system isn't the product, it's his brain externalized. He cloned how he thinks into code. And then he shared the secret. Maybe I'm a yapper, I would just like talk to the agent all the time. Maybe I like drawing pictures. Then maybe I still use Figma, but then the agent can just look at the mocks and make it, make it happen. I don't have to be forced to use any tool or input. And I can build in the way that I prefer. You don't need to build an operating system, but you can turn your playground into something real. For me, I think in stories and game mechanics, so I'm building Warlight. To some degree, it is my brain externalized. Ryu showed me something I wasn't prepared to see. He built an operating system to have a place to play, to think out loud in full fidelity instead of static pixels. And those 16-year-olds he mentioned, they're not waiting for permission. They're already doing it. No preconceived notions about how things should be done, just doing. I miss that. So I'm building my own playground where stories become experiences. So do me a favor and ask yourself, what playground would you build? Because I promise you it is already there in your head when no one's watching. And it might be time to let it out. I'll see you next time.